I've probably never mentioned this before to you guys, but uh, I just thought I'd mention that it's a whole lot of fun sanding a raw instrument from scratch. You know, trying to get all of the detail smooth and no scratches. And for whatever reason, this type of quilted maple seems to hold the scratches and not turn them loose. But the saving grace is I'll only have to sand it about five more times or so when I put finish on it. So even though I've already been sanding for about four solid hours, I'll uh, get the opportunity to do that all again a few more times. So that's the saving grace in this. Obviously I'm kidding, but you really have no idea how much sanding goes into one of these things. I mean, it just goes on forever and forever and forever and forever. I will say some do sand easier than others. Actually, the Paduke sands fairly easy. This stuff here really doesn't sand that easy at all. I mean, it's not hard to sand exactly, but it seems to hold the um, little previous sanding marks and previous cut marks deeper into the grain or something, and it takes more to get them out. The wood itself isn't all that hard, but I guess because of the alternating hardness in the different places of the wood, it makes it very difficult to sand. I've decided I have to get everything sanded and I have to go ahead and cut this, uh, these slots for the binding up here before I stain, stain it. And the reason is because I just want to do one thing of staining and airbrushing and before I put the binding on. Otherwise I'll be doing it in two or three steps, which would not be very productive. But I was hoping to quit sanding for a while. And no, I just moved up here to the neck and peg head. The problem with this, to be perfectly honest with you, is it's still very difficult to know if the neck is shaped just right until you get the fretboard on it. So even after doing all this, there's a chance I'll scrape it down and redo it anyway. So, that's just the way it is when you're building one from scratch. You know, I think I've got the right feel to it, but you don't really know till that neck gets on there. And really, you don't even know till the strings get on there how it feels. I'm sure your angle's not the best on this, but I've got my Proxon router all set up with the specialty tool that I made to fit on the bottom. And uh, by the way, this has that slick plastic on here, so it slides real easy. I'm going to route the binding channel for this. This sits on the top of the uh, peg head. The cutter runs along the side of the peg head. So the cutter is right there. That's what will cut the slot. Anyway, it looks like this. and. Here we go. good. The one negative of this is that this aluminum rubbing on there does leave a line. It's usually not too bad to sand out. Seems like on this end grain it got a little deeper than normal so I'm gonna have to do a little more sanding on the end down here. Also on this end because it's sloped it doesn't cut as deep so I may set this a little deeper and do these in and do this end again and that's what I think I'll do. Once again, not a very good angle for the camera at all. I've got to do the hand routing, and I'm going to just do that freehand around this little scroll and around the big scroll. And once I get that done, pretty much finished with this. I've kind of penciled in just 
for my eye purposes, you know, about what I want to take off. Quite honestly, it's just kind of a feel thing and experience thing. I'll show you what it looks like when I finish it up. Well, my friends, I have spent basically a whole day just detailing this. Now that included cutting the binding slots, but there's a lot of detail to that. So I've got all the binding slots cut on the peg head and everywhere, body. I have sanded the living tar out of this. I mean, I have sanded this one like I've sanded no other one. It ought to stain well, at least I hope it does. This is where we have to start making it ugly to make it look pretty. You're gonna see a grown man cry right on camera. <laughs> Here we go. Those of you who have never seen me do this before will be completely horribly shocked. The rest of you have seen this many times and therefore you will understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Be prepared to be shocked. Here we go. Isn't that a pretty color? <laughs> you know, even being colorblind, I can tell that's just wrong. <laughs> well, there's at least one good thing I can say about that. I don't see any scratches. That's amazing. That's amazing in and of itself. But after all that sanding, I shouldn't. My gosh, I couldn't believe how much I sanded this thing. I don't know if you can tell much about it right there or not, but anyway, there it is. Kind of anxious to see this side because these sides just look beautiful to me. So I think this is going to be gorgeous on this edge. Well, I had told myself I was going to tape off these two body points because I don't really want to get stain on them and I've already gotten stain on them so I guess I'll stop there and tape those off and start again. <music> There's old Yeller. <laughs> it's just plain wrong. That's all I can say. <laughs> now we'll move on. This just in, the customer was just here and he said he wants to leave it this color. He said he thinks it sets off the red rose better. So we're going to just leave it like this, I guess. Uh, April Fools, even though it's not April. It might be April by the time you see this though, you just never know. Anyway, we're ready to start the next phase. I have the Feebing's dark brown leather dye right here. And we'll see what kind of a mess we can make with that. And for those who think that it's too dark, I mean, it probably doesn't show up that great in the light here, but you can see through the, the curl shows through that brown really well. In fact, it, when we're done here, it'll actually show up better than it will with just the clear or the yellow, I believe. But we'll see. I mean, the whole goal is to make it really stand out. You know, I'm not trying to cover up the, the curl, you understand. Okay, it looks terrible right now. Yes, I know, I know, it looks horrible. Be patient, be patient. I know you're having a major coronary over it, but I'm just having a minor coronary. I've been there and done this many times. Oh yeah, now you're starting to see something. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Look at how that's starting to come back. 
yeah we got a lot of work to do yet to get it to max it out but it's getting there and it ain't going to be that hard to do i don't think wow oh my goodness <laughs> oh man i tell you what if you don't think that's pretty then you and me just don't think alike that's all i can tell you oh my gosh Oh my gosh, I have never, and I say absolutely on camera, I have never seen a piece of wood any prettier than that. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That is going to be gorgeous when I get it all done. I knew it was gonna look like that. I could tell from before I even started. But I have to admit that it's even maybe better than I thought it would be. And especially on the book matching across, I never dreamed it would be that good. I just didn't dream it would be that good. Oh my gosh. I would just say this, if the customer's not happy with this one, oh my goodness, I think I could auction it off for twice what I'm selling it for. You just don't find them like that very often. Oh man, that is just killer. Well, I'll keep working on it. Maybe I'll just go to the side here, because this one side I thought was just going to be gorgeous also. It just has the right kind of wood in it to just be gorgeous. So we'll put the dark stain on the ends of where that really fancy grain is. And then we'll lighten it up through here just like we did. And now we'll get some alcohol on that. Well, that's really pretty. It's not quite as pretty as I was expecting the side to be, to be perfectly honest. I was expecting this side to just be the most gorgeous thing on it. And had the back not turned out so spectacular, I would say these sides are pretty darn nice. Because <laughs> they are really nice. But boy, that back, it's hard to beat that back. You know, it's dulling down now because this alcohol dries really fast, so the finish looks dull. Once we coat that with lacquer, oh my gosh. We'll keep going. I'll show you what it looks like when I get her done. Well, I'm sure there would still be a few of you that would argue you would prefer to see it uh, blonde, but I gotta tell you something for sure. You would be hard pressed to find a prettier looking mandolin than that right there. That is some gorgeous wood. And the contrasting, you know, grain going up and down is what really shows it off. And once we put the clear over it, it's gonna even be twice as nice. I mean, it's really nice now, don't get me wrong, but it's gonna even look twice as nice. So it's gonna just be gorgeous here before long. I don't know if this will show up on camera, but if you've ever seen flames boil up, like on a house fire where it boils up under a roof or something like that, well, that's what that looks like. It really does look like the flame just boiled up into the smoke. Oh my gosh, it's just gorgeous. It really is. Okay, well, I'm gonna work on the top now. The top is quite lackluster compared to the back and sides but uh, we still want to try to make it look as nice as we can. And we'll give it our best shot here. 
Lots and lots of people ask because they don't know about properties of woods and things why I don't use the fancy wood on the top and it's all a sound thing. Really all acoustic instruments use a softwood on the top and a hardwood on the back and that's been going on since the Stradivari days and way before that even. So it's not something you would do and like the sound of if you did it. It might look pretty, but that's about it. It wouldn't play pretty, it wouldn't sound pretty. So that's why you use the plain wood on the top. And it is pretty plain compared to the back and sides. But then again, it's also kind of nice to turn them over and be surprised. Now we're taking the denatured alcohol and more or less doing the same thing we did on the other side and see what we can do to lighten it up. You see the uh, pattern is opposite. You know, one way the light goes into it and the stain goes into it one way and on the other side of the top it goes in the other way and that's just simply because of the quarter sawing effect and when you open it up the grain is running in opposite directions. Nothing you can do about that, that's just the way it is. Try lightening it up a little bit more. Again, the denatured alcohol is what lightens it up. And that looks real nice. While it's wet like that, you can kind of tell what it's gonna look like when you get the finish on it. We're going to airbrush this too around the edges a little bit. But that's looking pretty darn fine. You know, even though that top isn't anything like the back, it's still really nice. Might try a little more alcohol in the middle. Well, my next step will probably be to mix up some of uh, this dark brown in the airbrush with a little bit of I think I'm going to actually use oil varnish on this mandolin. I don't know, I might kick myself for it, but I think I'm going to spray on oil varnish, which is something I only did on chocolate so far, but I like the results I got on chocolate, and I think this oil varnish is one of the best sounding finishes you can put on an instrument, so that's just going to help it that much more. You're talking about the ugly duckling phase. We're in it with this mandolin. I have put quite a few coats of oil varnish on this, about probably five or so, maybe more than that. It goes on very thin, very similar to the lacquer. The biggest difference I've noticed is that well, of course, there's two things. One, it takes longer to dry, so you really have to give this 24 hours to dry, and even that's pushing it. The uh, lacquer dries in just a few minutes, basically. The other thing that's quite different about this is that it runs at the drop of a hat. I mean, seriously, you put the least little bit too much on and it runs. So you have to put these layers on very, very thin. And I'm putting them on by spraying them. And uh, even spraying them as thin as I can spray them, it still uh, has a tendency to run. You know, if you paint brush it on, it'll run really easily too. So, I mean, it's not like it's any different. Actually, I would say it probably runs less with the spray than it does with the paint brush, because I've done it both ways. I've also done it with my fingers. It runs just as much that way too. Bottom line is you can't put much of this on at a time. I have gone over this with steel wool first now I'm going over it with this uh, sandpaper that I really like, this stuff that doesn't build up. And this is 400. I'm just lightly going over it with that. And honestly, it seems like the sandpaper's doing even a better job than the steel wool did. If you were just wanting to knock it down a little bit between coats, the steel wool is fine. 
But now that I've put so many coats on here, I want to do a little bit more than knock it down. I want to level it quite a bit. And the steel wool, in my opinion, doesn't seem to level all that well. I mean, it does to a certain degree, but this level's better, I think. Anyway, did I ever tell you how much sanding there is to building an instrument? Yeah, I'm seriously telling you, building an instrument is the easy part. When you get to this much sanding, you just won't believe how much sanding there is. We'll show you what it looks like at the next step. Well, hello everyone. It's another day has dawned here in the shop. Still working on this mandolin. For calendar purposes, just not that it makes any difference, but today is election day. <laughs> By the time you see this, election day will be long gone. I have done a lot of work on this mandolin off camera, and I hope you like it, because it's been a lot of work. Did I ever tell you that when you build your own instrument, there's a whole lot of sanding? <laughs> oh my gosh, is there a lot of sanding. Not only do you have to sand the bare wood a lot, but you have to sand the stained and finished wood a lot. Now this is just a rough finish right now. Don't think this is a final finish. It's not. But you can start to see how pretty it's going to be. My gosh, if, if you could find a prettier piece of wood somewhere, I'd like to know about it. That is just gorgeous. And you know, it winks at you. You know, you, you move it in different ways. You see different patterns, different shapes emerge and things but it's probably the most book matched piece of wood I believe I've ever seen, really. And then the, here's the sides, and you, again, they move on you. The same way with these sides here. Put the really gorgeous side up where you'd see it all the time when you're playing and things. And the neck itself is really pretty too. It's, it's not bad. Now keep in mind, uh, the neck is really not at its final perfect shape yet because I don't have the fretboard on here or anything. The reason I did all this staining and finishing is because I'm going to put on clear wood binding and I wanted to get the majority of it out of the way before I put the clear wood binding on here. And in fact, that's the step I'm at right now is to start the binding. Just for the record, I did not use lacquer on this. I used the True Oil gun stock varnish. True Oil varnish is a pretty darn good instrument varnish. And in my opinion, oil varnishes really do produce about the best sound. I sprayed this on with my sprayer, and I will tell you the good and the bad. The good is that this finish covers, uh, I don't know if I'd say faster than lacquer, because it goes on really thin, kind of like lacquer does but it doesn't run away from the voids and the holes like lacquer does. Lacquer seriously runs away and creates its own craters where you might just have the least little tiny pinpoint hole by the time you put enough lacquer on it, that hole will be, you know, like the size of the end of a pencil lead, you know, and instead of a little tiny needle prick, it's more like a big large pencil lead uh, hole. That's the way lacquer works. It just does that. And it's a pain to fill those voids like that. This stuff does that a little tiny bit, but not nearly to the degree that lacquer does. So this went on much faster. Now there's quite a few coats on here. I, you know, I probably put on a half dozen coats and then I sanded the heck out of it. And then I put on uh, two more very, very light coats after sanding. So that's what we're at right now. It's just a clear oil varnish, but oil varnishes aren't perfectly clear. They have a little tint to them, you know, uh, just slight, maybe golden tint, if you will. They're not perfectly clear. It's not bad. I'm pretty happy with it, you know, just like everything. I always want better. It doesn't matter how good it is. I want it to be better. But I'm going to be satisfied with this for now, and it's time to start the binding process. So here we go. 
So the first thing I need to do in order to put the binding on this is now to clean these slots out again because they've been over sprayed and so I'll try to focus in on this a little bit. But basically I'm just going around it and just cleaning it. I've got this chisel really honed up very sharp so I'm just trying to very carefully slide all the finish right off of there not really cut the wood too much but that's going to take a lot of work and I'm not going to show all of this effort because it's just boring repetitive scraping and cleaning and scraping and cleaning and I might actually use it like a scraper more. I think that might actually work better. So the bottom line is I'll find a technique that works here and then I'll show you what it looks like as we start to put the binding on it. thought I'd show you the technique that I have settled on. It's using this sharp X-Acto knife. The knife is, you know, wasn't a brand new blade so I honed it a little bit on my uh, hone and then I'm just holding it very closely as a scraper. So here's the technique. You hold the blade really close like that and you scrape. Now up here around this scroll it's actually harder to do than on these flat areas. Like in this flat area here it's pretty easy. You just go across it like this and it it scrapes it really quickly and gets all the stuff off and you can see all the stuff coming off of there. The only thing you got to be careful about is that you don't slip and cut a big gash through your top or back and that could happen so you got to be fairly careful of that, fairly mindful of that. Not get in too big a hurry but on the other hand you got to move at a decent pace or these things just take forever. That's working pretty well and you can see how cleaned off that is compared to how dark it is in other places so it's it cleans it off pretty fast. So we'll do a whole lot more of that. I'm at my side bender here and I have a strip of the sycamore. and see if the camera will focus on that up close. Probably not. Anyway, there it is. Hopefully it'll focus a little closer in where you can see it. It's got a pattern on it. I've already started to bend this. I'm bending it around this very tight bend at the top and that will equate to the little tight scroll curve on the mandolin. So I just spritz it down, get it wet, put it on here, use the aluminum to hold the moisture in and to spread the stress out both and then I just kind of walk it around this and it starts to bend it. And it is splitting the wood a little bit when you bend it that tightly you're going to crack it a little bit but I don't think there's anything that will be a problem. I think I can glue those little cracks right back together and no one will ever notice it and I don't think you'll ever get it much better so you know there's not much point starting over and trying to do it better because I don't think I'll get it much better and there you go and you can see how it's flaked out there but those flakes will bend right down and glue back and I don't think there'll be a problem. I don't think you'll even be able to tell it. Obviously if I can tell it I'll have to do something different but I don't think there'll be a problem. And you just have to kind of go with it sometimes because you're working with natural material. You know it just doesn't work like you hope it will work. So now I'm just going to start opening up the bend a little bit more. And now I'll have to test it on the mandolin to see how it's fitting. Really, it could even be tighter. It's very hard to get it tight enough. Even as tight as that bend is, it, it could be tighter and it wouldn't be a problem. I'm just going to have to go see if I can make that fit up and decide if that's going to work or not. I 
Well, I'll move the camera around because it was kind of in my way where I had it. I've gone on down a little bit more here, you can see. I've glued back the splitting out ends with some, some CA glue, and they're going to be fine. You just have to do stuff like that sometimes. And I'm just going to go ahead and try to put some more bend in this so it'll be closer to what I need at the end. I have to say again that I really am happy that I started using this sycamore for binding. It's really pretty and it's really very easy to bend by comparison to other types of wood or other plastic even. Now I'm going to try to bend the other long side on the mandolin. So we're going to bend this part now and uh, I'll get started with that here in just a moment. kind of difficult to judge the distance on some of these bins and sometimes I get them just a little too short or a little bend them a little before they should be or so you just have to kind of adjust. That one worked out pretty well. Now I just need a large bend in the middle. I'll show you what it all looks like when I get the rest of it all bent up. Here's what it looks like so far, and so far I'd say it's going on very, very well. I'm sure this is actually dry enough I could take the tape off because I've had a number of other interruptions and we're doing a number of other things since I taped that up. But I'll leave it like it is for now. It doesn't hurt anything. I'm going to go ahead and get the glue on this side and hopefully get the binding on this side. Just taking a toothpick and kind of spreading it around a little bit. I've already got pieces of tape torn and stuck over here. The reason I put them over here is because it, it keeps the fibers and things off the tape, keeps the tape real clean because this is very clean. I've wiped it off and it's painted and everything so it doesn't pick up any extra foreign material. Someone was telling me I need to have it up here closer but you know that's close enough and you know as long as you can reach it that's Plenty good in my opinion. This side here has a more of a compound bend in it, or this end does. So I'm going to start on this end first to make sure it's right. So I want to pull it into place, pull it down, pull the tape down real well. One thing I will tell you about the fact that doing this finish work first and then putting the binding on, one real advantage is the tape sticks much better. Oh my gosh, it sticks so much better it's not even funny. So that is a real advantage of doing it this way. And the tape has a lot more power to pull the binding in tighter, which is always good. And of course I didn't really make enough, but I don't need many more. Not that big a deal. Made that one twice as long as it needs to be. Well, that looks real nice. I'll give that a little while before I go messing with the rest of it. I have profiled the fingerboard for this mandolin and now I'm just bringing it over here to the sander to just touch up those little fine curves. That's about all it needs. I've already straightened the edges on the uh, belt sander. Might need just a little bit more work there yet, but it's pretty close. Now we'll move on to looking at the inlay and the frets. So I'm ready to put the fret wire in this fretboard for this mandolin. And I'm not going to pre-bend this. Sometimes I do. I'm just going to try this one straight and see how it goes. This is a plastic hammer, just so you know. I will say the fret wire seems really tight in this. Doesn't seem to be going all the way down. So I'll try this and see if this will drive it in a little bit better. That might be working. Yeah, that looks okay. 
takes quite a bit of force to drive this down in there. It depends on the piece of ebony a lot. I think I'm going to have to get something more like steel underneath this right here because it's just driving hard. So I went and got me a real heavy block of steel and that ought to give me a little more firm backstop for driving these frets in. They're kind of twisted. It's weird. They're really not cooperating very well at all. There it went in. I don't know why they're twisting like that. The other one did that kind of too. Yeah, they're going in there now. That steel makes a lot of difference. It's really a good heavy backstop. It's an inertia issue. The steel has a lot more than this little fret wire does. Yeah, that's much, much, much better. It's very noticeable difference with the pounding them on the table and pounding them on the steel. So if you're having trouble with that, just get you a block of steel like that or an anvil or something that's heavy. I guarantee you they'll go right in. Yeah, that's, it, it's really noticeably different the way it feels even when you hit it. Well, there you go. Didn't take but just a few minutes to put all those in there. Well, we're making a lot of progress on this old mandolin. Just got two, well, maybe three more main steps before I'm ready to uh, start the detail detail. I've got to put the binding around the peg head here. I've already put the binding on this fretboard. I did that off camera. But I also, uh, one of the other main steps is I want to uh, scallop the end of this. So I'm going to take this tool here and scallop this down. Actually, I could do it on my thickness sander. And in fact, I might do that. I might take and run it into my little homemade thickness sander. But the, the trick is you don't want to hit this fret. So I could run it in up to a certain point, And then I might have to finish it up with this. I think I'll do that. It, and we'll we'll take a little video of, of actually doing that. Well, I'm here at the thickness sander, and I'm going to run this through. Hopefully you can see that's how it turned out. Not too bad. I'm going to have to go ahead and fill this. I don't like to have to fill them, but in this case, I don't think I have any options. I mean, I could go thinner and it might cut it out of there, but it looks like I'd have to go quite a bit thinner to get to cut out all the holes. So I'm just going to fill them and dye it black and we'll just go with that. Well, my friends, I think that's where we're going to leave it for this episode. I did get it scalloped. I filled it. I dyed the Timbermate black first, but it didn't turn out all that terribly black after I put it in there. You can see it's definitely a different shade. I don't know if that's gray or if that's kind of got a purple color to it. I can't tell, but anyway, it's a different color. It's not black. Even though I use black dye, like I said, anytime you stain something, there's a thousand different outcomes and you never know which one you're going to get. And that's the one I got that time. So anyway, we're going to leave it go at this for now. And hopefully in the next uh, video, we'll complete this thing and, and get some strings on it. That would be my hope. Hope you've enjoyed it up to now. Blah, blah.